Okay, thanks very much for staying this late. I know kind of it's been a long day. Um, the original idea with this talk is to show you how to make API Gateway sensible, but about a month ago, the team that works on API Gateway, by the way, is anybody here from the API Gateway team? Nope. The team that works on API Gateway kind of did a new release and pretty much destroyed my talk. So in the context of, you know, serverless not meaning without servers, uh, I was left speechless. So um, then kind of we, uh, I've been able to drop half of the kind of making API Gateway sensible. So we're going to make this kind of timeless as well. And um, what I'll talk about is a couple of things that surprised us as we were moving an app from Heroku into Lambda. And potentially, if you're thinking about that as well, uh, hopefully I can save you some time and a bit of hair uh, from kind of not having to run into the same mistakes. So um, somewhere in February this year, uh, we had this weird edge case where we were integrating with the Google API that pretty much allowed us to do cross-origin requests for everything apart from uploading photos. And uh, there was an outstanding bug for about a year and a half for them to fix that, and it didn't look like that's going to happen. So we had to kind of proxy the photos through the server. And because that's kind of, I, I really don't control the size of what people will upload, so it might cause a stupid amount of latency coming in, you know, on, on, come, on from the client. Plus, then we need to proxy that to Google's APIs that sometime kind of time out. That's not something I wanted to do kind of directly on Heroku. So I came up with this brilliant idea how I'm going to let people upload to S3, and then I'm going to build up a scheduling mechanism, and then I'm going to dispatch tasks and put SQS there. It's going to be amazing. And this was my five minutes of fame again. I'm going to do something serious rather than kind of, you know, a website that talks to database. And um, I have this friend who um, pretends that he's working most of the day. So if you look at him like he's you know, typing, but if you go behind him and look at his screen, it's actually Hacker News all day long. I don't know, kind of, if anybody has a similar person in the team, or are there any people like that in the room? Yeah, good. So, um, and I was, I was talking to him about what I plan to do. I said, well, you should really check out this Lambda thing, because pretty much they've built it. So it was kind of fuck. But um, um, then, you know, uh, uh, because... I'm financing or partly financing this tool myself. I wasn't going to spend months and months building my own dispatching framework. So we kind of built it into Lambda, and about four months later, pretty much we migrated the entire backend to Lambda, um, which was an amazing journey. And um, we were able to do lots of really interesting things like modularize stuff much better than we did in Heroku. We're running it even slightly cheaper, but that's kind of not the real point. And we, we I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly happy with what we've done, but we've also kind of encountered a couple of really interesting pain points. And overall, kind of my entire experience migrating from Heroku to Lambda kind of is probably best summarized by this. Does anybody know what this is? Okay, now I'm going to give you kind of a really irrelevant piece of information that's going to kind of bug you from now on forever. This is the international medical code for a spacecraft collision subsequent encounter. Kind of, I, I, I'm completely amazed that somebody came up with a coding scheme where, you know, they have a second hit by a spacecraft as kind of something separate that you need to be kind of coded against. And um, kind of what I mean by this is kind of, this is something that's kind of very strange, but at the same time, very, very amazing. And this is my general experience moving to Lambda. Kind of we keep discovering these kind of hidden gems and, and hidden problems all the time. One of the most amazing things that um, I think is kind of strange but amazing and fits this definition perfectly is how they've done multi-versioning. And I think multi-versioning is nobody's really talking about that, but for me, that's one of the biggest kind of advantages of that platform compared to everything else I've seen. Because every commit, every push to Lambda gets a, a different numerical version of the deployment. And pretty much you can append that numerical version with colon 15 with whatever is calling Lambda, whether that's kind of a file upload or a direct call or a web API, and that's going to call that particular version of the Lambda function. That stays there forever. Um, and that means that all the stuff around rolling up and rolling down releases is trivially easy because we just have to kind of reconfigure what 
points to 15. And another really lovely thing that they've done is they kind of you can assign textual labels to numbers. So you can say production is 15, then deploy 16, deploy 17, deploy 18, test, 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 test. Now 18 is production. And as kind of pretty much um, when calling into the Lambda, you can say call on production. That means that everything is instantly going to be rewired to call the production version. Which is completely amazing. We started thinking about this as kind of development testing production, kind of those are our environments. But this actually allows you to do incredibly interesting stuff like uh, A-B testing on the backend code. That is incredibly complicated if you want to do it yourself, kind of on a normal platform where you have to do multi-version yourself and then people do feature flags and kind of it's horrible. But this is kind of a very nice clean solution. This also allows us to, for example, expose functionality to a certain number of users only. If I'm working on something and the performance is not that good, I can allow 100 users to see that by routing it differently, and everybody else sees the old version while I'm kind of figuring out what to do about the performance in the new version. I can release certain features to certain categories of customers where kind of it's end-to-end it's -end proper multi-versioning. Now, of course, kind of this all sounds fantastic, but the way you need to configure stuff for multi-versioning is horribly painful, and all the kind of uh, I am uh, privileges and everything is a mess to kind of get around to configure. And of course, API Gateway doesn't call it the same as Lambda, so API Gateway has stages, Lambda has aliases. They're kind of similar, but not necessarily the same, and then there's a whole kind of magic how that needs to get set up. But once it's set up, it's absolutely amazing, because it allows us to do proper kind of multi-version development and proper multi-version deployment end-to-end. -end. So, kind of, one of the guidelines that um, we started kind of applying to really get the value out of this is to embed the version config into events. Where, what I mean by this is, a single container might end up serving as kind of part of the production or production, or it might be kind of uh, part of an A-B test or something like that. At the same time, because textual aliases can be reassigned, I might have a container that was running as testing previously, but is now production. And any kind of stale data or any configuration that is cached in the container might start biting us really badly. And it did a couple of times. So our policy is now kind of to try and embed the version config as much as possible in the events that call the Lambda function. I strongly recommend you try and do that. That means that, for example, if the Lambda function needs to call out to a third party API and you need the URL for that, put the URL in the API gateway stage variables so that when it gets called as production, your Lambda function just calls out whatever it has. Another example of that is we are doing lots and lots of file conversions where people upload stuff to S3 it kicks off a Lambda, and pretty much the Lambda always returns the file back to the same S3 bucket. So if it gets called from a testing bucket, it's okay. If it gets called from a production bucket, it's okay. Kind of generally, the function doesn't really care whether it's production or kind of uh, testing or part of an A-B test or something like that. So the other thing that uh, kind of... Uh, is really, really interesting that we started encountering when we started doing multi-version like MAD, and this is especially kind of early on, is kind of probably best summarized by this uh, injury code. And this is another one, kind of a, a f absolutely fantastic injury code that's kind of walking into LAMP post subsequent encounter. So they have a kind of international code for people that, you know, hit their head repeatedly at the LAMP post. <laughs> and that's kind of pretty much how I feel about my first month deploying stuff to Lambda, because um, we ended up following the documentation online, and all the documentation online is overly simplistic. And generally, kind of all the examples that we could find online then were kind of one Lambda is one endpoint. And that means that once we started migrating from this monolith, the endpoint to create a user was a single lambda. The endpoint to modify a user was a single lambda. The endpoint to update some other user details was a single lambda. And all of that was configured with a separate API gateways. Ended up being, yes, you can do multi-versioning and all that, but it was just a deployment hell. So kind of my, my big lesson from that is kind of one Lambda shouldn't really be a single endpoint. Um, y yes, it allows us to do kind of these micro, micro functions, but um, the um, guideline that I kind of try and use now is stuff that is tightly coupled on the same data format, 
goes into a single Lambda and we will configure multiple endpoints to kind of talk to it from API Gateway. For example, PayPal payments and Stripe payments and other types of payments will all be different endpoints, but I will have single Lambda function that does create a user, update a user, and modify kind of user details as we are changing stuff. And that's because I want to have a quick way of propagating the data format update to everything. I don't want to have to multi-version kind of a single conceptual piece of data all the time. Yes, that's possible, but it's not the best kind of use of our time. So, um, and kind of, uh, I think generally um, my thinking about this is lots and lots of stuff, especially with kind of serverless and function as a service and things like that, ends up being these really tiny, tiny, tiny functions online. And that's okay because we want Hello World examples, but we ended up kind of following that too much. So I, my, my kind of uh, thinking is if something is really tightly coupled on the same data entity and data format, that code should go live together at the same time. I, I, I want that code to go live atomically. I don't want that code to kind of be half-baked and then have to deal with multi-versioning inside what effectively is the same function. So um, the, the reason why I think lots of people end up in this situation is that API Gateway up until recently was so stupidly difficult to configure that it was much easier just kind of to do one lambda and, and one, you know, call it from a single endpoint. But that, that's no longer the case. So um, the third thing that uh, kind of um, I, I think we started experiencing quite a lot early on before we figured out how this thing really, really works is R461, which is amazingly a injury code, kind of it's a medical code for a bizarre personal appearance. And what I mean by that is occasionally we'd get really, really strange data from the container. And um, we thought about this thing as stateless. I, I kind of, in my mind, I equated serverless to stateless. And that's not really the truth. The, the way they've kind of done stuff is Lambda does remember stuff and it tends to remember stuff that's really kind of deceiving and, and inconvenient for you. So as we were moving kind of from a monolith where lots of stuff was managed in memory, uh, I expected if something's stateless, then you know there will be a fresh state at every request. So we'll spot stupid problems if we make mistakes, for example, putting stuff into local variables. But that's not really true because kind of uh, when you're doing a you know single developer version testing and you're the only one using the container, it's very, very likely that the container will be reused which means that you know, stuff can mislead you into thinking that it's going to work and then it starts hitting on production. Lots of users now use different containers and it might be or might not be reused and kind of there's weird stuff like that. So um, one particular problem that we had with this is where uh, because of the multi-versioning, we might end up kind of assigning two different aliases to the same numerical version, which means that the same container might actually end up being production after it was used for testing. And kind of configuration caching that we used on the container then starts causing some really interesting problems. But the, because you, know, you don't really have control of the containers or how they're spawned or how they're killed, um, kind of those problems tend to be bizarre. And um, one of the things I really kind of um, think uh, uh, we, we should think about to if you want to kind of avoid the same problems as we did, is kind of not designed for stateless, but designed for share nothing. Kind of designed for an architecture where the container does exist and the container kind of does have its own disk storage space, like Patrick said this morning, you can run out of temp space. And kind of where if you kind of leave it dirty, it, you know, it will wait for you dirty. Um, with Node.js in particular on Lambda, there's a kind of secret configuration flag to tell it to stop immediately after the Lambda completes. If you don't do that, anything that's left in the queue kind of keeps executing, uh, which is kind of not you know, stateless. So I think it's much, much more useful to think about this as, as a shared nothing architecture rather than stateless. And I think kind of all the documentation they're selling Lambda as stateless is kind of misleading. Um, so kind of the um, last thing that um, I've kind of really experienced very early on is W5541XA. Um, now you know how this works. Would anybody care to guess what this code is? <laughs> ah, kind of bitten by pig initial encounter. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> but very close, very close. So I kind of, you know, 
my, 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 my first two days uh, working with Lambda, I really felt I was bitten by a fucking pig. So um, um, when we did this kind of proxy thing, it was amazing. I finished it in, in 10 lines of code. And now I'm going to go live. And I use the web console that Amazon has. I you know, deployed it. I tested it. It's amazing. But you know, I'm a developer. I'm not going to deploy stuff through a web console. I wanted to deploy it through the command line and automate it. And then it didn't work. And then I tried something else, and it didn't work. And then I tried something else, and it didn't work. And then I tried something else, and it didn't work. And two days later, I had a shell script that deployed 20 lines of JavaScript. And the shell script was about 140 lines. <laughs> now, um, at this point, uh, you know, the, the risk that I have a bug in the 20 lines of code is irrelevant compared to the risk that I have kind of something stupid in the 140 lines of deployment scripts. And that's kind of the big problem for me. And the second lambda was 140 lines. The third lambda was slightly less. And kind of we realized that kind of the testing we have for the code is, is kind of not covering anything of the risks. And I kind of started looking at, well, we need to automate this in a different way. And that's why I think kind of um, generally there's so many tools emerging in this space where kind of people are figuring out how to automate this stuff. Um, and um, I, I was really surprised that Amazon kind of didn't really do a, a better job of creating a deployment tool for this. But then a couple of months ago, I read this really interesting article uh, from uh, Werner Vogels that he, where he talks about how kind of um, they intentionally made uh, this a universal software. And they've made the configuration magic, kind of almost. Not, not in those words. What he actually said is that kind of his lesson three out of the 10 lessons kind of uh, from 10 years of Amazon Web Services is that the market wants primitives, not higher level tools from Amazon. That kind of, if they build frameworks, then people complain how, you know, it has the kitchen sink in it and it's too complicated. But at the same time, if they build it too small, then people complain it doesn't do kind of the other tasks. So one of the lessons that he had is that kind of Amazon should deliver primitive tools and let kind of the ecosystem patch it up for more narrow cases. So um, Lambda and API Gateway are the closest thing to universal software I've seen, where kind of it does anything, you just have to configure it. And the big problem of just having to configure it is it's too complex. Um, I, I have a confession to make. About 10 years ago, I was a decent Java, Java developer. And I'd wake up in the morning, and if I don't do at least 50 kilobytes of XML, I don't feel that I've done a good job. <laughs> but um, kind of I've stopped you know, being addicted to XML. And um, generally, in February this year, kind of, you, know, you look at the deployment options, and it's swagger, and it's XML, like 50 kilobytes of XML. And the other option is do shell scripts. And I tried to use kind of a framework um, that was out that time, but it wasn't clever enough. So we ended up uh, trying to kind of just unit test the deployment. There's a bunch of tools around this that um, are emerging, in, and there's lots of different interesting tools that are emerging. And I think my, my big lesson that I think people should think about immediately is find a deployment tool that works for you. There's a um, couple of classes of tools. Uh, some tools are going to... Uh, abstract away AWS. Some tools are going to kind of run you, let you run tasks. Some tools are kind of just deployment tools. Um, for, for the use case we had, I didn't want to abstract away AWS. I just wanted to have my deployment properly tested. So kind of we ended up taking some, building something that just takes a Node.js project and kind of pushes it to AWS with sensible defaults and kind of zero configuration. And I think kind of generally with any universal software, if you narrow it down to the use case you need, you'll need 5% of it. So find a tool that kind of does the 5% that you really want. Um, if you are doing Node.js and um, you want to kind of start deploying stuff with out abstracting way AWS and things like that, have a look at kind of claudiajs.com. That's kind of the tool we open sourced at the end. Um, it helps people set up um, API Gateway and AWS and all this kind of multi-versioning mess with um, author authorization and everything else. Um, there's a really great article that was published on the new stack yesterday, which kind of lists a ton of other alternatives for kind of abstracting AWS, scheduling jobs, different platforms, and things like that. So that's pretty much it. I ran out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>